I am still liking the 9 a.m. games. I know mm-hmm. some people, maybe Josie Altador, don't like it a little bit because it's a little bit too hot. But uh, you know, it's good to it's good to wake up to to Major League Soccer. Welcome everybody to Extra Time, driven by Continental on MLSSoccer.com, the official podcast of Major League Soccer, and on YouTube. I am David Goss, joined today by Matt D and Chuck D, my two fellow podcasters who are have already challenged me. Uh-huh. This morning, Doyle on everything that's ever happened, and Charlie burning my man Ray Gaddis, the legend of <laughs> Philadelphia Union, in our interview that will be coming up with Warren Craval. Charlie, I did not think he would be a traitor to me like that. You know, I I don't think I am, and I think it was just <laughs> I think it was just a lighthearted fun. Okay, as long as Ray says it's okay, because he's he's my leader. I follow him wherever he goes, whatever he yeah. needs. We will talk to Warren Craval about the design he's done for the black players for change, for all the protests that we've seen, for what change we can see in the world, and, of course, about the Philadelphia Union, who got a 1-0 win in their first game over NYCFC, and they'll kick off their second game coming up this week. And then guess what we're going to do? We're going to talk and analyze soccer games in Major League Soccer that have occurred (laughs) already, almost like the design of this show that was originally created like 10 years ago, and it's been about four and a half months. Feels pretty good. It does. It does. It, no, it absolutely feels good. I, I'm, I am still liking the 9 a.m. games. I know mm-hmm. some people, maybe Josie Altador, don't like it a little bit because it's a little bit too hot. But, uh, you know, it's good, to, it's good to wake up to, to Major League Soccer. Yeah, I, I second it. I know as a player, <laughs> I, would, I would be livid. But – I'm not on that side anymore. I'm on this side. So waking up with a, a nice, fresh pot of coffee and then just watching these games, I, I, I'm all about it. Mm. Charlie, welcome. We call them armchairs. This is what we do here. <laughs> we talk, we don't do. And it makes life so easy. Don't forget, you've got 9 a.m. games some days. You don't others days. But every day at 11 a.m., you've got MLS Today presented by AT&T on MLSsoccer.com, Twitter, and Facebook with Susanna Collins and Kaylin Carr and sometimes other people floating in and out and always some great guests from down in the bubble. Uh, Speaking of the bubble, we do have a coronavirus testing update. Of course, as every single person knows, there was an inconclusive test and a positive negative that came out uh, from D.C. and Toronto FC. It led to the game on Sunday morning being postponed. That was played on Monday morning um, and... It was played by Toronto for about 70 minutes and DC for about 20 minutes. Uh, I wonder for you guys, this morning, you wake up, Charlie, you got your fresh pot of coffee. You watch TFC do work. Ayo Akinyole, nice young striker, gets two goals. This is kind of what we expected. Toronto's the best in the group. DC maybe is going to struggle. DC goes down a man. And then everything gets way peak MLS. Of course, at 10.30 in the morning yeah. at Disney Wide World of Sports. Charlie, what was your reaction to the uh, this game? Well, initially, I'll tell you one thing. I did love the fact that Ayo Akinola got the start because I know he has potential, and I want to see more of him. And, you know, just looking at his runs in the first game, minute 14 in, Michael Bradley zips in, a ball to his feet on the ground, diagonal, top of the box. He loses it, not ready for it. Fast forward, minute 11, uh, 43, he takes the goal. He gets the ball to his feet. He turns, creates his own shot, and bangs it home. And you're like, within 10 minutes, he understood, I need to, I need to sharpen up, I need to get my feet set, and I can do something when I, when, I, when I have possession. Love it. The confidence in him. Made great runs. Then with his left foot, not the best finishing because he had two opportunities against Brad, uh, Bill Hamid. But again, it's pro- it's a progress. It's a step in the right direction. You want to see more of him. You're encouraged by his movement, his his uh, his finishing, uh, you know, inside the box, outside the box, just putting shots on goal. Uh, but I was really impressed with Michael Bradley this match. He stood out to me. His movement, his his uh, ability to break up plays, get it, finding the right spots, his uh, the balls that he were he was able to play, organizing the midfield. Very impressed with Michael Bradley. Probably. To be honest, the the best match I've seen him play in a long time. He was he was sharp, and it's you talk about coming off an injury, coronavirus, four months off, all those factors. It makes it even that much more impressive. Um, but again, this is a, a match where we saw a team get ahead 2-0. You're up a man. 
the heat plays a huge factor. You're subbing guys off. You're like, okay, we got them 60 minutes, 65 minutes. Let's make some some changes. We'll take the our foot off the gas. We'll slow it up. It didn't happen like that because in D.C. just – Started putting some passes together, took advantage of that one one play to Higuain, who who's not the fastest guy, but <laughs> was was alone on a breakaway. Go figure. How does that happen? I don't know. But alone, beautiful lobbed goal, and then all of a sudden you could see they they realized, oh, we have a chance. We have something here, and they played motivated. They played spirited, and they ended up getting that second goal. And you you, you just were left puzzled to think. You had that game in your hand. It was done, but you took advantage of it, it and you and you were and you paid the price. Let me let me put a little bit of history on that, which is Pablo Mara tweeted out via Opta Jack that DC are the first MLS club to, club to have a player sent off while trailing by two plus goals and still managed to get a point since 2007. The mm-hmm. teams before that were 0, 156 and now one. So uh yeah. Doyle, it wasn't like uh Oh, two zeros, the most dangerous lead in the game, blah, blah, blah. Like this was oddly historic for them to come back. And on TFC side, they subbed both center backs, the 64th mm-hmm. minute, uh, Chris Mavinga and Omar Gonzalez going off, Simon and Zavaleta coming on. And then, as uh, Charlie said, Pipe Higuain was wide open down the middle a few minutes later. Yeah, and he looked like Usain Bolt running away from those two guys. Uh, it was It was just a disaster just disaster class from Simon from the, the moment he got on the field. Uh, and Zavaleta was probably equal to that in terms of, of his performance. And I think it, it goes back to, to Greg Vanny at this point. Um, he, he's given these guys a lot of rope. And over the past couple of years, neither has shown to be up to the job. And I'm wondering why it was not Liam Frazier getting – one of those positions. And now there, there's some argument that Liam Frazier is probably more of a natural six. I disagree with that, but I know that's what he wants to play long-term, but we've seen him play at center back and play well at center back over the years. Um, at some point you have to trust the, the guys who developed instead of just going to veterans who um, struggle time after time, after time. It, it was, I, look, it's essentially like, it feels like the first game of the preseason. Because they're usually in pre, like the first game of the preseason, it's 30, 30, 30. And like clearly these guys are running out of gas at the 60 minute mark. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's why, that's why you use your depth. Like that's, that's why you build this up. And they've done it with Akinola. And Fraser has had good performances. Why not trust that guy? Why, like, why keep going back to veterans? who make the same mistakes time and time again. So what was, I think it, from a, from a Toronto perspective, um, fans are going to be frustrated and they're going to be right to, to feel frustrated. That said for the first 65, 70 minutes of this game, there was only one team on the field and when they're at full strength, um, which they weren't even at full strength because there was no Josie in this one, but when they're at close to full strength, it, Toronto showed you all the reasons to think that this is a team that is once again going to compete for multiple titles. And the big difference is, as Charlie said, Akinola's runs were great. Michael Bradley w- looked excellent and refreshed, and maybe nine months off will do that for you. Um, but Pozuelo as well, mm-hmm. his his two way ability, like he created the second goal with his pressing. He wasn't doing that at all last year, so that is part of the deal now. Uh, then I, I think Toronto's going to be fine. But like at some point, Greg Vanny has to change up his central defensive depth chart because it's just not working with those two guys who came in today. Well, it might be this week. They will play again on Thursday against a Montreal team that has a week off. And you mentioned, Greg Vanny said in his postgame, Mavinga and Omar were hurt. It wasn't that he chose to give them a rest. So if, those, if one of those two or either of those two can't go, we're back into this same conversation. And Jonathan Osorio... Hurt as well, who's a major part of what they do. So they have a little bit less depth than they would expect. On the flip side, real quick for DC, it's a huge point. Uh, ben Olsen looked like he was ready to play at the end of this one, how pumped up and excited he was. Does this give you any hope for them or, or any belief that they can get something done in this competition? For, for me, it's it's all about team spirit. They they showed that they came together. We were, da- we were down and out. No one... No one, I, I, even the DC players probably thought, 
This is out of our control. You don't believe in them, Charlie. You don't believe. <laughs> no chance. But I think it highlights how much work is needed for this team to be actually be competitive to compete for a championship. We everyone wants to win, and you're you're always based on can you compete for MLS Cup? Can you compete for the Eastern Conference Championship? This team has a ways to go. Uh, but, you know, but I, I want to point this out. They looked a lot better when Yamil Assad came on. Right? It wasn't just the the changes that that uh, Greg Vanny made that were didn't work out for Toronto FC. It was bringing on a player who we've all seen in 2017 and 2018 before he picked up that injury in, in like August of 2018. He was like a top three or four winger in the league. Yamil Assad's a really really good player and just like a one man difference maker for this DC team. I still believe in that front four with Assad, Flores, Gressel, and Ola Kamara. I think like if they just figure out that back six, you don't have to take any risks. Just attack with four. Those guys will get you to good enough, but not good enough to win a championship, but like good enough to not have games where you look like you looked for the first 60 minutes of this one. The, the first the first goal uh, or second goal for Toronto was a straight preseason play. Yeah. But that goal by Higuain, Felipe should not should have not been in the game. He should have been sent <laughs> off. They should have had two red cards. So at the same time uh, as the players, I think the referee uh, was going through some preseason uh, adjustments as well because that was a red card. And then uh, the, the the second yellow that um, was given to, to result in the red card to Junior Moreno, that he should have been sent off earlier as well. So, I mean, <laughs> the, the game finished 2-2, but – there should have been, DC should have had nine guys, not ten, to finish that game. So then, I think we both agree this is one where the the result is pretty misleading. Even though yes. Toronto absolutely collapsed down the stretch, and they should be furious with each other, I I don't think there is a ton to worry about for TFC beyond like we have to sort out our second string center backs. Um, like even Quinton Westberg, I'm giving him a mulligan on that on that Iguain uh, chip as well because it's Iguain. So. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. TFC now going on short rest uh, against the rival in Montreal, and then New England will get DC, as you said, Junior Moreno with the red card, so he'll be suspended. Let's go into the games we saw this weekend. It was a good bulk of action in MLS, mm -hmm. and I want to start on a high. Do not start negative, Doyle. I will not allow you to. Columbus Crew beat FC Cincinnati 4-0. Do not start with Cincinnati. Start with Columbus. Zellerion was incredible. This uh -huh. team looked to be firing on a lot of different cylinders, even missing some potential starters uh, in Valenzuela and Pedro Santos. Yep. Throw a little praise on Caleb Porter's boys. I, they looked they looked really, really good. They they kind of knew what Cincinnati's weakness was going to be, and they were able to exploit that with, uh, I thought, some really clever possession. Just you draw Harris Madunian in up field and then you exploit that space and his inability to to close down defensively and it was Nagby it was Artur doing it a little bit and then guys like Mokhtar um, and obviously Zellerion and Jossie Zardis uh, punishing punishing those kind of slow and naive defensive rotations from Cincinnati it was exactly what you would what you want to see, I don't want to say what you expect, but what you would want to see from a team that brought back so many key players from last year and mm -hmm. added in Nagby, one of the best on the ball players in the league in central midfield. So is they took their strengths and they went right at Cincinnati's weaknesses and uh, people are going to say what they want about Jossie Zardes, but the man's over 70 MLS goals now. And like he he scored in double digit goals, I think three or four seasons in the league. He always makes the right run. To me, it looks like his touch has improved a bit. He's never going to be Josie, right? He's never going to be Joseph. But if you get that center forward who is totally reliable and you have creative players behind him, you're going to score goals. Um, and then the other thing, Caleb Porter deserves a lot of praise for the way he brought along uh, Abubakar Keita last year. Yes. So when Vito Vermgar got her and I, you know, fingers crossed for him because that looked gruesome. He had no hesitation. He said, I, I trust this guy. He played a thousand minutes for me last year, put him right in. Kata had a, a pretty good game and now it's his job to lose. That is exactly why you have an academy. That is 
part of the job of being a coach at this level. And, and the crew are in a better position because of it. The Columbus crew uh, didn't surprise me at all in this match. Of course, they're playing Cincinnati. <laughs> You can't take that. You see, uh, Charlie's the negative one, Dave. No, I'm just going to got a little positivity. Yeah, no, no. I'm, this is all about Columbus Crew and the progress that they've made and, and how they play as a team and the pieces that they have. But let's not forget they're playing Cincinnati. This isn't Seattle. This isn't Toronto. This isn't LAFC. This is Cincinnati, the worst team in the league. Okay. <laughs> now we got that out of the way. Uh, I will say this, that Zellerion free kick goes in against Seattle, Toronto, LAFC and any anybody. other team, probably that against Barcelona um, and Chelsea as well. Facts. Definitely against Chelsea yes. with Cat facts. Plus. Yes, <laughs> but uh, as as Matt Doyle said, um, Zardes is is older and wiser. He's cleaner with his touches. I think the national team uh, caps and experience that helps that brings you along as a striker, knowing how important it is to hold up the ball, the build up, you know, being involved in different ways. You, you can see the way he plays. It's not just, okay, I just got to make a run. I just got to make it I make a run into space. It's more, how can I link up? How, different types of runs around the box to open up his hips, to be more of a threat in different ways. He can score in, in I think, and finish in, in better, more effective ways than he used to in the past. So um, he, you just see a, a more well-rounded striker in Jossie Zardes now, which – is obviously a, a huge benefit to the Columbus crew. He's not just one dimensional anymore. Um, Zella Ryan and, and Nagby in the midfield can pull the strings and then outside backs can provide service. I mean, Harrison Affles can still get up and play level with Jossie Zardes at times when they, when they have possession because you have Nagby who will not lose the ball in, in, in tight spaces where, whether he's surrounded by two or three players, cause he's that good that allows you to, to take those risks as outside backs. And those players can play um, and be in, in better suited positions to, to sustain that attack. So um, this Columbus crew team is going to be very difficult to deal with. They, they, are, they are a complete team. And if Caleb Porter can continue to mold them and get them to play a certain style um, and, and stick to that style, obviously you adjust here and there, but stick to a certain style playing style, this team is, is going to be one of the favorites uh, come, come the end of the year. They could get Luis Diaz to stop shooting from midfield. They might be unstoppable. But <laughs> Doyle, here is your space. Yap Stam had two weeks with FC Cincinnati when he got hired in Cincinnati and about two weeks in Orlando. So this was his first game. As we've said, everything else going on, it's borderline preseason game for some of these teams where you're at. Um, and it went very poorly for FC Cincinnati. And then it starts to feel like it did last year with energy levels and frustration. You could see Kubo shaking his head at guys and different things going on. Um, are you jumping off? And Because uh, you were like kind of Cincinnati has a shot. They have more talent. I think you and Andrew were those two guys. I'm going to put you there. They do, they do have more talent. They for sure have more talent <laughs> than, than last year. Look, the problem is a lot of the talent doesn't fit. Um, I don't think you can play Harris Madunian and Sim DeJong in the same midfield together because both those guys – need two other players to do the running and defensive work for them. Like we saw it with Philly last year. Madunian has he's one of the best passers in the league, but Philly had a scheme where he did not have to leave that area directly in front of the center backs. Pick up second balls there, shield them a little bit, and then spray. Well, in, if you go back and you look at the foul that led to the Zellerion free kick and then the, the play that led to – uh, Jossie's first goal, it's Columbus combining and DeJong playing kind of as a second forward and not really closing anyone down. And so Amaya has to go up, and that means Madunian has to go up. And suddenly you have Harris Madunian 60 yards from goal trying to close down Darlington Nagby 1v1. How did that go? Not going to happen. <laughs> so I just like if you play, if you play Madunian, in, then you have to put probably Amaya and Alan Cruz in front of them and say, okay, here's game film of what the union did last year with Bedoya and Montero. If you like the only, and then, okay, do you bench Dijon or do you put him as like a, a wide right playmaker? Cause if you do that, then you have to rethink how you're using Kubo. You have to rethink how you're using uh, Locadia. You have to rethink your entire depth chart. And then the other option is, okay, 
it, you maybe you, you bench Harris. Like his passing is fantastic, but he's such a liability defensively um, for a team that gave up 75 goals last year and does not have the best center backs in the league. We'll just say that. Like, can you have a guy who's a defensive liability as your number six? It is very early in the season, um, but through three games, since he has given up nine goals, I yep. like it's you. You have to have a rethink. You just you have to, you have to take a look at that. So we need, gonna, need time. And, and we need time. It, it, it it kills it kills me to say it because I love watching that man pass the ball, but like there is more to the game than than that. So anyway. but we all but we we knew Yap Stam was going to come in and it's going to take him three four months to get it right. Plus, you have to give every player an opportunity, a chance, not only in training and matches, and all of that preseason is lost for Yap Stam. This is a preseason for him. He's going to experiment. He's going to he's you should expect him to lose games six zero seven zero eight zero because. You're going to try different formations, different players. Maybe he sees a player, uh, you know, who's typically played as a more an attacking player, plays him as an outside back. Just those those growing pains as a coach. We, I, that's like Jossie Zardes. I told, my expectations are to the lowest you could possibly have for a team. <laughs> lowest. And, and and that's you're also missing Jurgen Lokadia. I mean, this is a player yeah. who can stretch defenses, who can, who can get you that lone goal if you're just defending with 10. You know, so yeah, that was going to be a release valve and right. a kind of like safety net that mm-hmm. they had just of pure quality, which doesn't exist and doesn't sound like he'll even be around for the group stage. And we'll see if they get out of there. Let's move to the other side of this group, though. Uh, the game before this one, New York Red Bulls, Atlanta United, Red Bulls got a 1 0 win. You could feel the energy. I think this was like one of the first games where I felt like it was an MLS game. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, my boy Florian Velo comes out with the goal, so you know it's feeling good. Every- Life is okay. Nothing to worry about. Uh, but, Doyle, for this New York team, you were interested by the way they set up, um, mm-hmm. and were you surprised by the performance? Uh, no, not really, because it's, it's Red Bulls versus Atlanta. We, we know that other than once, we know how this game always ends. Um, and Velo getting him back healthy is a huge piece for this Red Bulls team because I don't think he's a best 11 caliber winger, but he's like a, you know, all-star caliber winger. And he certainly showed it over the years when he's been healthy. Um, So Red Bulls came out and they pressed the first five minutes. They got the goal out of it. And then they dropped into a mid block four, four, two that actually kind of played as a four, two, four because Velo on one side and then Kaku as a left midfielder pushed really, really high. And it kind of confused Atlanta. So Atlanta ended up playing a lot of long balls. It's not the best idea when you don't have a center forward. They played with a false nine. Um, And and they really struggled throughout most of this game. It it like uh, Brad Guzan, I think, had three gigantic saves. The Red Bulls had like 30% possession. And they were totally content to not press to just let Atlanta turn it over at midfield and then to go in the other direction and try to get on the board and transition. It like it was preseason finishing. They weren't sharp in the box, but you have to be encouraged by that, I think. What was, I think, a little bit less encouraging was in the second half down the stretch when they were trying to lock this game up, Adam John comes on and completely changes things, not just for Atlanta, but for the Red Bulls. And it was like... It, David Jensen had to make a, a great save. There were a couple of desperation blocks in the end. And so the Red Bulls were, once again, pretty lucky or were pretty lucky not to drop points from a lead, which is what killed them all of last year uh, and cost them in the second game of the season against RSL as well. This was the, this was the most uninspiring Atlanta United. <laughs> I was about side. to ask. The, the <laughs> most uninspiring Atlanta United side that I've seen since they've been in the league. Um, we knew they were going to struggle when it comes to goals. You're, you're missing arguably the league's best goal scorer in Joseph Martinez. But the, the lack of creativity in the final third, Barco starting on the bench, and then uh, you leave it all on Petey Martinez to, to come up with something. We've seen him when he struggles. And when he struggles, he does not look like the Petey Martinez that you're spending, you know, $15 million on the, the, he didn't look like he had a firm grasp of, 
how he was going to uh, get into the final third, what those uh, combination plays look like, who's going to be on the end of crosses, how many guys are going to get into the box. The, the, it just looked off. It looked like they had not played together for a long time. And, and uh, you talk about uh, Rosetto. He looked like he was dropping deep, and then Castro was the guy who was you know, supposed to be the Joseph Martinez scoring. Didn't look sharp. Most of them didn't look sharp. They didn't look clean on the ball. Um, New York was – was energetic. They looked like they, they were up for the challenge. They looked like uh, a team that was, even though they didn't complete me- very many passes, the, the passing percentage wasn't high. Uh, the, the corners were four to four because they were still, when they got into the final third, they were trying to get a shot off. And whether it was on target or it was deflecting for a corner, they looked just, they looked better. They just looked overall better than this Atlanta side. And I'd be extremely concerned if I'm an Atlanta United supporter because this does not look good. And I and I get it. It's pre, you know, four months off. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys aren't fit or sharp, whatever. But this this did not even look anything like what we've seen from the, the from some of the good teams that we've seen thus far. When you talk about uh, Sporting KC for a majority of the game, New England Revolution uh, in their first match, RSL in their first match. There, the, these teams were off the same amount of time, and. <laughs> So, and some and some teams maybe have a little bit more turnover, and they still look better than what we saw from Atlanta United. So, uh, again, uh, they have a lot to figure out. My man Charlie, preaching the truth. I appreciate that. They've got more games coming up. Uh, they will face off against FC Cincinnati next. So if you do want to figure out how to score goals or get some confidence back, that might be a good game for them going forward. But who knows? They played once before, of course, the week after Joseph got hurt in the regular season. Uh, Let's move to one of the teams you said who played well for about 70 minutes. Unfortunately, the games are 90 minutes as Toronto and SKC found out. Minnesota, a 2-1 win in stoppage time against SKC. Ah, boy! Kevin Molino. (laughs) Legends away, so I get to yell as loud as I want today. So I had to get one in, because you know he's going to get more goals. My man, hot boy, Kevin Molino, getting it done for Minnesota. Uh, Tim Melia gets a red card in about the 73rd minute. Uh, with SKC up 1-0, and then Minnesota pours on the pressure with Aaron Schoenfeld coming on the field and helping create the change uh, for Minnesota. Doyle, was this, or Charlie, whoever wants to start, was this SKC gets a red card and gives an opening to Minnesota? Or was this a Minnesota United team that without Ike, without Ozzy, without Luis Amarillo, who got hurt in preseason, has a way through Kevin Molino to win games? You want to take it, Charlie? You go ahead, because... I'm, I give, give myself some time to calm down. All right. Oh, boy. I, uh, <laughs> I like sporting were the much better team through 60 minutes, but it, Minnesota actually started coming into the game before the red card. And it was through Molino, and it was the ability to just find that gap off of Ilya's shoulder, right? And once he get, starts getting on the ball in the half spaces, Ilya is not going to close him down. He's not going to catch. Roger's not going to catch him. Gotti Kinda, like maybe, but probably not. Like this is Kevin Molino, and fully healthy Kevin Molino, which we haven't seen in years, has been really, really good in this league at times. Um, so it was kind of like just, I don't want to say it was a one man show because this Minnesota team, which was out without Ike, without Ozzy, without Amaria, they were like, they, they play tough. They, they they battled, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. But it was a case of like, okay, we actually have a mismatch. This Sporting Kansas City team, for as much improved as, as they are, their midfield cannot move. They cannot run. And if we can get Molino on the ball in transition, he's going to make things happen. And if you look at it, he was part of every good chance they had. He was part of the buildup on the red card. And, of course, he scored the game-winning goal. So it was like it was a perfect storm for Kevin Molino to remind everyone of how good he can be in this league. And it was a really big warning for Sporting Kansas City that as good as they looked in the first two games, the problems that they had early in the or last season are not entirely solved. You back, Charlie? I'm back. (laughs) As, as Doyle said, um, you know, Sporting Kansas City was by far, by far the better team for those first 55 minutes, 60 minutes of the match. But Minnesota, even though they came back in the game and, and they, they got some momentum and the, 
the Tamilia red card uh, obviously changed the game drastically. But for me, the way they play is not going to get them results in the long term. It's it's you win games here and there, but if you're talking about over the course of a season, they're not going to get results to put themselves in a position to to really win. The, the, I didn't see a lot of quality from them to to say, you know what, this this Minnesota side is gonna is gonna do some big things, which I was expecting when you have Ike Opara um, and you have Ozzy Alonso, uh, Mason Toy, he didn't show well, um, and you know. The, he had to come off because of an injury, but Aaron Schoenfeld did come on and he was that point guy. He held up the ball. He was strong. He was simple. Um, he, he had that shot that came off the crossbar, uh, which was, which was good footwork. And, and they, and a lot also his, his touch, which set him up for that shot. But this, the, the I think it's still Minnesota showed me too many, uh, areas where they need improvement. Um, I, I liked what I saw at times, from Hassani Dotson, we, we know he's a talented player. Uh, Greg Goose uh, all, all also showed at times a lot of quality, gets forward, covers a lot of ground. Uh, Robin Lode, uh, didn't see enough of him because sometimes you're like, are, am I going to get you all offense from you or am I going to – are you just a more defensive player? Are you a player that's going to do a little bit of both? Um, just I don't think enough. And then – Rob, um, Ethan Finley is, is just one dimensional. You know what you're going to get from him. Uh, sometimes he looks like a, a, a bar, a, a winger that's going to get goals, going to get assists, going to create havoc. And then sometimes you're like, you know what you're going to get. It's straightforward every time, straight, yeah. straight, straight. And you, you, it's predictable and it's easy to defend. Um, so it's a great result for Minnesota. You, but they need to get a lot better. So you take the result and you're like, oh, we didn't play that well but we need to improve in, in a lot of different areas of the game. You could say the first about hour of this, it was all SKC on the ball. Pulido, Doyle had another big performance, even if he didn't get the goal. If Gerso or Kinda kind of just plays out a few mm -hmm. wide open opportunities up the field, tap-ins, it could have been 3-0. Yep. Uh, yep. And it wasn't to your point. That's something we saw from SKC last year, and that's a place they need to get better in. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how they turn this one around and, of course, Tim Emilio getting the red card, so he'll be suspended going forward. Let's mention the other game in the group, and I will eat a little bit of crow on this one. RSL put up a, a pump-up video on Twitter before this game that had me and Andrew Weeby trashing their attacking <laughs> options, and they came up and crushed Weeby's dark horse pick. Not mine. 2-0. Uh, Brian Babb emailed us and said, this is my first time writing. Been a subscriber for a few years. Rarely miss a show. Over the years, I've thought about writing, but this finally got him motivated. The lack of conversation about RSL leading up to the tournament has to be called out. I know RSL played an unwatchable game in week one when they started three center backs and a four-man back line and a right back as a right winger. We had so many injuries, but it was designed to be ugly and it was effective. Week two, we were the far better team over your beloved New York Red Bulls, but true to 2019 RSL form, we were bad in front of goal. I believe the quote about RSL was, what do we know about RSL? Uh, nothing. How much Ooh. has our defense changed from last year? How much has our team changed from last year? Did we finish third in the West or not? We still have a great defense. We still have great veteran leadership. We still have a pipeline full of exciting youngsters. We are just giving the kids away. We still have Everton Louise, who's one of the more underrated enforcer sixes in the league. We still have a humble, chippy tactician calling the shots. Kyle Beckerman, we are still punching our above our weight. We have all the raw ingredients to be your favorite dark horse. But by all means, please talk more about how our Rocky Mountain rival have gotten so much better out under Robin Frazier. I love that guy, but the feeling he will be pushing for some moves this summer, I hope he can make it a rivalry again, because until they do, give us some love. Well said. Fair statement. Yeah, well said. I mean, they, they played Colorado off the field, and they've won 11 of the last 13 uh, Rocky Mountain Cups, so they deserve to crow a little bit, and they were just a far superior team. They are just a far mm -hmm. superior team, and I think this guy got his moment in the sun and just move on to the next one. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> Colorado, a little bit of a struggle. Let's see if they can turn it around. Final game we didn't mention, Seattle played San Jose to a nil-nil draw on Friday night. I think the less we say about that one, maybe the better. Let's move on. First, first 30 minutes were good. The first 30 minutes were fun. The rest Doyle enjoyed the first 30 minutes. It's, it's there in print or in podcast, whatever we call it. Uh, let's talk about the games coming up, though, because we still got more soccer coming our way. It's going to be a great week of action to start it off. Let's do it with someone who actually knows what's going to be going on 
down in Orlando. Warren Craval, Philadelphia Union midfielder for our AT&T call to the field. Warren, thanks for joining us. Oh, man, appreciate you having me, fellas. We are very excited to talk to you, Philadelphia. Great start to this tournament and a lot of expectations coming forward. But let's start first with what you're wearing, what everyone has been wearing down in Orlando, coaches, players, um, black players for change, help put together some clothing about Black Lives Matter, about what they've been talking about this entire time and what the protest was all about. And I believe you are the man who designed all of this. Is that true? Um, yeah, yeah, that is true. Um, specific with the, uh, with these shirts that, uh, the BPC was wearing, um, throughout a protest, you know, that was very much a collaborative process of what we wanted our messaging to be. So I don't want to take any credit for, you know, what they say. Um, cause that was all the group, but yes, um, as far as, you know, what it looked like. Yeah. So take more, a, oh, I was going to say, no, I was going to say, can you, can you tell us what the, the block of text it signifies on the back of these tees. Like, how did it come to be, and why is that the messaging? Well, the uh, the back of the um, the solidarity tees that are being worn league wide. Um, that's probably one of the more you know significant parts of the design. It you know says exactly what it is, what this moment is, what everybody wearing this is. You know, it says what it's not. It's not about politics. It's not about you know, black versus white. It's not about, you know, it's not divisive. You know, this is us standing together. This is human rights. This is, you know, putting black lives mattering at the forefront. You know, this is, it's not a distraction. You know, sports can no longer be your distraction. You know, this is, this is us using our platform for the betterment of the world. So I'm interested because you have <laughs> that moment before the first game, uh, where every player came out that's part of the black players uh, for change and had that protest. And then you have these shirts that now you're giving out to everyone in the league, not people that are part of the black players for change. What's the feeling when you see someone maybe who doesn't know what it means or when you're handing it over and know that everyone else will be wearing it? How do you try and make sure it's not just, you know, a fashion sense or, or doing what everyone else is doing that it has real meaning? Um, you know, for me, I think, the main thing that I, you know, wanted going into this design process because I knew it would be a very much inclusive thing and, you know, it would be educational even, is that, you know, the bottom, you know, I I, uh, I had a very deliberate sentence um, stating that, you know, by wearing this shirt, you're signing, what you're signing up for. I stand in solidarity with the black community in the fight against systemic racism. So it's it's very black and white, what it, what, what you're, signing up for when you're wearing it. And I didn't want it to be ambiguous at all. Warren, I was, you know, I was moved to see that you and Alejandro Bedoya and the rest of the team uh, were able to come up with something that surprised everybody wearing the names of many of the black people who've been murdered by the police at the hands of the police, police brutality. Uh, what was that conversation like among, among the players? I know I spoke to Alejandro Bedoya a little bit in, mm -hmm. in educating Every every player who was going to wear somebody, uh, went, wear somebody's name and represent them on the field, knowing what happened and, and the injustices that people suffered. What was what was that conversation like in the in the locker room? Um, you know, I think that was a, a really huge moment of it. You know, aside from the presentation of it, you know, just getting, you know, all of our players and staff, you know, educated on what's happening because there are certain names on there that, you know, aren't covered as much by the media. So you're going to, you know, learn about things that you might not have learned about. And mm -hmm. I think that enables, you know, players to be even stronger catalysts for change, you know, and you're, you're seeing, you're getting exposed to, to things that you might not have been exposed to. So um, it was, a, it was a blessing that all the players were, you know, obviously receptive to the idea, um, you know, with, Ray and, you know, Marlon Kenzie and, and myself and Alejandro leading the charge. Um, you know, I think everybody was was more than on board with uh, with getting this done. What's been the reaction, both internally from the team? How do players feel that were a part of it? Maybe players that have learned about some of the stories they didn't know and externally uh, from around the world. Um, I think in, in general, you know, throughout, you know, we, we had a, a team discussion, you know, internally, you know, even before on this. And um, 
You know, I think it was it was really eye opening. You know, a couple of us shared our experiences, and I think internally brought us together closer as a team. For being honest, you know, and when you're able to to empathize more with you know your fellow teammate, you know, you're you're gonna have that closer bond. I think. <clears throat> and externally, I think it was it was really well received um, from from you know as far as I saw. Um, you know, the sports world was was kind of shocked. Warren, I was so impressed and surprised with the way that that first game went down, the protest, how it came together so beautifully and was so touching. Uh, I didn't I don't think I ever expected it to, to come across that way where everyone came together. Were you surprised or were there any surprises about how well and how uh, meaningful that first protest was as well as your your first game protest um you know seeing the coaches sit that you know sit, kneel with you guys with the gloves with the shirts uh mm -hmm. anything stick out in in your mind um in my mind you know uh when we were you know still in the hotel and you know started seeing you know a lot of the guys you know funneling into you know get into their you know respective cars and i was at that moment, that was the first time that I had saw everybody, you know, together, you know, dressed in all black in these shirts and, you know, just to see the amount of us, you know, representing this league, I think was, it was huge. It was like a really eye opening moment, even for myself, because, you know, you're able to see, you know, just how diverse this league is and how much, you know, we, we represent this league. Um, so I think that was the first moment where I was like, man, like this is, this is going to be powerful and, you know, getting to the field, getting in our formation and, you know, just seeing everybody out there, you know, standing together. Um, it was huge. It, it, it felt surreal. Um, you know, it, it felt like it was, it was bigger than, than sport, you know, um, and getting to see it back, um, on a broadcast, I, it, it was amazing. It was impressive to watch, and as Charlie said, emotional from home. And one of the things you said was just the, the amount of players, right, and and how much it mm -hmm. is. And Major League Soccer is a black league, and yet we talked a little bit about this with Kai Kamara. At the front office level and a lot of coaches, it, it's not as representative as the player pool is. Um, you've been around this league for a while. You've seen guys, and you've seen the process stepping off the field into that, that future. Um, what do you think about – how there can be opportunity and how there can be equality in that space for players. And, and have you thought about it for yourself? Um, I mean, I think one of the, the biggest parts of this is, you know, it's, it's planting seeds now, you know, it's, it's, um, it's bringing up these conversations that need to be have. It's, it's planting seeds in, in younger players minds, you know, what, what I want to do, you know, after, after I'm done playing, what, you know, what is available, what can be an option, you know, seeing, you know, guys like Ali Curtis, seeing guys like, you know, Robin Frazier, obviously Thierry Henry, you know, in these in these different, you know, positions, you know, Dennis Ham. So <clears throat> um it it's definitely, you know, allowing us to to expose, you know, certain realities. And at the same time, you know, start start getting the gear spinning for, you know, certain guys, you know, and opening doors if we can. Warren, the the first match you beat New York City FC, and, you know, it wasn't the most dominant play, but you're dealing with the heat, the climate. Um, you conceded possession, but you got the job done. What was the messaging like after the locker room? Were you guys like, we just wanted to, we got the result. Who cares how we did it? And you move on. And how, what are you expecting for the next match? No, nah, I mean, down at the field level, I mean, everybody knew just how tough it was to get a result like that. Um you know, down there in the heat and, you know, you, you can just feel it on the, on the, on the pitch, you know, you just, you're not, you're not able to, to cover as much ground as you could, you know, on a cooler day, you know, so I think everybody was very cognizant of how tough of a result that was, you know, so it was at the end of the game, it wasn't like a, oh, I'm glad we got that done. That was like, yeah, like, let's go, <laughs> you know, like, let's go boys. Well done. All right. Let's set the record straight. These 9 a.m. games. How <laughs> difficult. I, I know you're like me. We need time on the table. We're, we're not young bucks you know, anymore. You know? You know? 
Those morning wake up calls, you're talking about breakfast, treatment, and then getting warmed up to play. And if you're not starting, still trying to be awake to watch the game, then get warmed up. Tell me what that process was like. How difficult are those 9 a.m. games? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I was telling somebody I haven't played a 9 a.m. game since, you know, my mom was driving me to games. So <laughs> yeah. I think <laughs> I think just settling with that reality was was really tough to do. And, uh, you know, having a pregame meal, you know, you don't know whether to eat eggs or, or pasta, <laughs> you know, it's it's just kind of of a weird one. And, <laughs> you know, Were people I, eating pasta? Nah, I, uh, I don't even remember what I have. It was all a blur, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> 5 a.m. breakfast tend you to know, be hard to remember. Found my way to the table at some point and said, you know, probably just work it out. <laughs> work it out, get me going. <laughs> Uh, I wonder for this team, the conversation about what you can do in 2020, what you can do in this tournament, because you go to the Eastern Conference Finals last year, um, ending on that high, but you did swap out a huge player in Harris Madunian, who was your minutes leader and a big piece of what you guys were going to do going forward. A lot of people have you as favorites. A lot of people have you as question marks. You kind of are in this weird place. What is the idea inside the team of who the Philadelphia Union are and what you guys can do? Um, you know, the conversation, you know, internally is, you know, we, we know who we are, um, and we don't really, you know, feed into what the media or fans, you know, tell us we are or who, who are not, you know, we get on the field, we handle our business and let the chips fall where they do. You know, I don't, I don't think anybody is saying, you know, oh yeah, we're going to finish at, you know, this, this place or this place. It's just, um, you know, we, we have a good team, we have depth, and we're gonna make the most of our uh, opportunities. Warren, the, the academy has always been stellar with producing all these young players. I remember uh, when I was playing with you, Brent Aronson was just coming through, Anthony mm -hmm. Fontana was coming through, and he looked like he was ready to play right away. Um, mm -hmm. Hasn't really had that opportunity. Can you talk about the growth and development of a Mark McKenzie, Brent Aronson, Anthony Fontana? And is there someone who hasn't played that's training with you guys that you're like, ah, he's, he's bound to, to be a breakout star. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the growth, I mean, like you said, from, you know, some of these younger players have, have been amazing. Um, you know, I watch Brendan Aronson from when he first started training with us to now. And it's like, man, like, I won't say he's a, a completely different player, but, you know, just the, just the level that he's taken it to because he was always confident. He was, a, he was never afraid to get on the ball. You know, it, even, you know, as he was undersized, he, you know, get in between lines, you know, go at anybody, you know? And I think, you know, his, his, his uh, cognitive development has just, you know, has been up here. And I'd say the same, you know, with, with a Mark McKenzie, you know, he was, uh, <laughs> you know, probably for me, the the highest, you know, trajectory, you know, potential on this team. Um, you know, I think he's he's got a lot of the tools to, you know, be in a lead play for, you know, our national team, you know, and, you know, view that around the world, you know, both both feet, bow, bow, you know, you've, you've seen him hitting those diags, you know, you've seen yes. him, you know, making these really intelligent plays, you know, to cover. And, um, you know, just, just to see that growth has been amazing. Charlie, and, talk. oh, sorry. Nah, 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 you gotta get. <laughs> no, Warren, you're the one giving me the good stuff right now. Keep going. <laughs> nah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we have, you know, a, a crop of even younger kids now, you know, with the Jack DeVries and, you know, Cole, you know, uh, Turner. And, you know, he kind of fits that to me, like more of like a, that classic, you know, Steven Gerrard almost type, you know, midfielder okay. that we don't see as much anymore, you know, um, where it's kind of, you know, he's he's very technically sound and, you know, um, isn't blowing you away, you know, athletically, you know, no knock on, but, um, you know, just a, a smart, you know, hard nosed player. And, you know, can, I think with time can really control a midfield. I got to ask you this. Charlie's talked to me a little bit about him. Everyone gets mad when I bring it up because once again, no one cares. You talk about hard nosed players. Ray Gaddis has been doing it every single day for such a long time. Never gets talked about. Sometimes try, they try and replace him, still comes back, wins the starting spot day in and day out, he stepped up as a leader through this whole movement for the Black Players for Change. And I think he's getting a lot of recognition he hasn't ever gotten. Mm -hmm. You've seen him work for a while. Just tell me about him as a person, a teammate, 
and, and what he's able to do for Philly because I have been singing his praises forever and no one wants to talk about it. All right, before you even get going, just tell him about the, the van rides from hotel to training. When my man was napping, he was napping, and I called him out and he said he was just praying. God, he said he was praying, he was praying. You, you pray for 15 minutes straight. Ray will pray all day, okay? Ray will pray all day. You know, and that's one thing you know I love about Ray. You know, he's a, he's my road roommate um, and, you know, has been since I've been on the team. You know, obviously he's been here for, you know, this is ninth season with the team. And, you know, you're absolutely right. I, you know, he doesn't get the recognition he deserves for being, you know, so consistent, um, you know, in this team. You know, he's coming up on, on 200 starts here, you know, and and – you would never know it. Um, but I think that speaks to, you know, the type of, you know, guy he is, you know, he's, he's not in it for the recognition. He comes to work every day. He does his thing, you know, and, you know, he, he uplifts everybody, you know, great for the locker room and, you know, just does his job and, and goes home. But yeah, you, you're right as well that he's been at the forefront of, you know, leading this team. Um, even with the, uh, with the BPC, you know, he's uh, on the board with them as well. And, you know, I think he's he's just handled all of this, you know, really gracefully and, and really, you know, phenomenally. You've got one game coming up, Warren. Uh, you got about 20 minutes under your belt that first game. Where does everyone feel in terms of, let's be real, we're in preseason, but we're also in the middle of the regular season. We're in a must-win tournament, and we're not. What do the legs feel like? Uh, how much rotation? Like, what do you expect game two and three to look like? Um, you know, to be honest, I mean, I think – a lot of people have, you know, recovered pretty well, you know, just from, you know, seeing seeing the uh, performance and training and, you know, we uh, we switched over to night games, you know, seeing the, the difference, you know, we're able to, you know, kind of make in a, in a cooler temperature. Um, you know, I, I think the team is still looking sharp. Um, so we don't know, you know, as far as rotation, you know, Jim will let us know. Um, but I think the team is still buzzing. I wish you guys the best of luck because you guys look like, you're you're sleeping giants. Like you're like we're gonna we're gonna ease into this, and then we're gonna turn it on. We're gonna turn it on when everybody's fit. You know, you know. I mean that that nine a.m. game that uh that that'll, that'll do it for you. So. <laughs> it's a good way to get things started. Let me close you out on one here, which is we've known your work creatively because we've worked with Kalen Carr for a while. You know that you've done since you've been in MLS. Why design? And tell us a little about Design FC and what you do off the field with kids in Philadelphia. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, shout out to my guy, Kalen, you know, <laughs> always got my back. But um, yeah, I think uh, I've been, you know, uh, working on design for, I don't know, maybe six, seven years or so. Um, you know, when first started um, Craval and kind of married, you know, my love for, you know, aesthetics, you know, visuals, you know, photography, curation, you know, sometimes that looks like parties or whatever it may be, um, you know, just kind of creating a vibe. And um, that's always something that I've gravitated towards. And the opportunity, you know, came uh, actually through Kaylin um, when we were shooting an episode of The Movement in Chester, where I got connected with a college student and, you know, we, we came up with the, uh, with the program of Design FC in Chester. And, you know, since then, you know, I, I think it's, it's given me, you know, a lot of purpose, you know, as far as marrying, you know, football to design, you know, to, to giving back to the youth. Um, it's, it's, it's been amazing, to be honest. It's been super fulfilling um, to, to see the way these kids are able to express themselves. If you guys don't know, um, we, uh, we enable them to create their own soccer jerseys um, through this program. And, you know, the things they come up with, the things that are in their minds and, you know, the the limits they push because you know they don't they don't know any better they don't know not to is is super refreshing you know they they put political statements on their jerseys you know they put what you know reflections of their neighborhoods on their jerseys um so it's 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 always been really cool to see my guy charlie popping in out and around he can never be held down uh warren we appreciate you taking the time uh for design fc is there any place people can go to help out uh, to donate, to volunteer, or anything like that? Um, yeah, we are uh, working on getting that website up. But um, at, the, at the time, uh, I think we have Design FC uh, on Instagram. 
Cool. So check us out there, you know, shoot us a DM. We're always um, looking for uh, ways we can, you know, expand this thing and grow. Well, we look forward to watching you get back out on the field. Group A, of course, chaotic group to start even before the <laughs> ball got kicked. Uh, you guys got it done in the first game with the win over NYCFC. I know my guy Ray Gaddis is going to get it done in all tournament. As yes, he sir. Does. Yes, sir. <laughs> we appreciate it, Warren. Good luck the rest of the way. All right, fellas. Thanks, appreciate Warren. you having me. Warren Craval doing great things. Check out his website. We'll get it out on Twitter as well to check out the designs he's doing. And as he mentioned, Design FC doing some really cool things in the Chester area. My guy Charlie obviously throwing a little heat where unnecessary. I will let it go for now as we move on. So you're lucky, Charlie. So our MLS Predict 6. Uh, MLS Predict, Predict 6 presented by BetMGM is back. A free-to-play game by Major League Soccer. Correctly predict the outcomes of the six featured matches along with secondary predictions, and you can win $50,000. Head over to MLS Predict and the number 6.com and play for free. Round 2 opened up noon on Sunday. We've got six games coming up. I want to focus you guys on a big one because we talked about these two teams in the first half of the show and how well they performed in game one, and this could be the decider to win the group. Columbus versus New York Red Bulls. Uh, the bet for Predict 6 is the first score minute range. We're not going to talk about that as much. Uh, what do you need to see, Charlie, in this game? Columbus is, is going to have possession because New York Red Bull have no problem conceding possession as they only had 30% against Atlanta, and they were able to get the win. So they're, they're going to look to, to capitalize off of, off of uh, bad passes um, and, and just that transition play is key for New York Red Bull. So Columbus have to keep possession in the attacking third and then finish on their chances. I'm going to be looking forward to see the combination play, uh, Zella Rayan, Nagby, as well as Zardes. If they're not going to let him play in behind, how can he impact the game? How can he influence the game, whether it's the hold-up play, the combination play? Um being able to just create a little space for himself and shoot, uh, be able to shoot outside the box or, or just out, just inside it. Uh, so Columbus Crew versus New York Red Bull, that's going to be an interesting game to see who can come out on top because whoever wins is winning the group. Yeah, whoever wins this one has basically got the group sewed up. Um, I am, I, I am pretty bullish on Columbus in this game because. I, I frankly think that with Zellerion, Nagby, and Artur in central midfield um, and two pretty good passers of the ball at center back, they will just rip up that 4-4-2 mid, mid block. Because you but can, do you uh, think it'll be that? So I think the Red Bulls will come out and press for 20 minutes. Um, and if it's like whatever the score is at that point, then it's going to revert to the, to the mid block look. And if you're playing with two central midfielders against a team – with guys as technical as, as Nagby, Zellerion, and, and Artur, um, you're, you're probably going to be in trouble. So I'm curious to see if, if, if Chris Armas will have another adjustment, right? Because he, this team has played a, kind of a 4-4-2 mid-block in the past, but last year it was a 4-2-3-1 where the playmaker would push up and be side-by-side -side with the center forward. The other night, it was like Royer and Barlow were true forwards, and Kaku and and Velo were way up high. So it was like almost like a four-two-four. Maybe they go back to a four-three-three. Maybe it's kind of a four-two-three-one with whoever is a ten, just to clog up that midfield and force um, and force Columbus to go wide. Because I just think. It, it, like Kate is a really good passer of the ball, and Mensa is a pretty good passer of the ball. So they're going to be able to knock it around drag the Red Bulls out, use that possession to pull then the central midfield of the Red Bulls up. And then you, if you're hitting third line passes to Nagby or Zellerion in that space, you're you're really big trouble if you're the Red Bulls. Nice little fact on that. Jonathan Mensah completed 135 passes against Cincinnati, second most since Opta started taking that number about 10 years ago. So yeah, that guy can pass the ball. We need winners though. We need picks here. Columbus, New York. Charlie, who is your pick and why? I'm going to go draw. Wow. Did not I'm see that coming. Draw. Yep. I'm going to go think, with the draw. You think, you think the Red Bulls are going to press their way to a goal on this one? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I think they're just going to create a turnover in that final third and then score, and that's gonna that's what's going to be. They're going to defend the rest of the game. I think it's going to be 1-1. Are you good? Uh, I think it's going to be a Columbus win. 
I, I think that they're just going to be able to move the Red Bulls around, find those gaps, and then, uh, you know, another goal or two for Jossie. I'll say uh, a pretty comfortable 3-1 crew win. I'm going to take Columbus as well. I'll go 2-1 on that one. I think it's going to be tight. But as you said, I think Columbus has so many ways to beat you. If you press, they can beat you over the top. If you don't, they can cut you open by passing through the middle. That one's Thursday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time on FS1. We've got so many games coming up for you. So FS1, 2DN, uh, ESPN, if you are in the U.S., TSN and Tevia as well in Canada. Let's hit one more game here, NYCFC versus Orlando. Coming up for the second game in the group for these two teams, uh, reports from Ronnie Dyla saying that Maxi Morales is out for what could be a few weeks. So Doyle, without him, a team that has not scored in 2020, missing their best attacking player, uh, what do you need to see from NYCFC? Well, it has not scored in MLS, right? They, they did get on the board a couple of times in CCL, but it's been three MLS games and no goals for NYCFC. It's a huge chance for Jesus Medina, sort of the forgotten DP, he is the he is the guy who you, you would probably expect to replace Maxi uh, in the lineup. And I thought NYCFC came close a bunch against Philadelphia. Blake made some absolutely spectacular saves. I'm pretty convinced that if they play at that level again, they're eventually going to put the ball in the back of the net. They will shake off that rust in the final third. The question is, can they play like that without Maxi? Like, that is a huge question for this team. They were helpless yep. without him last year. Um, and it's, a, again, it's, this has to be the moment for Jesus Medina to salvage his MLS career. Chuck? Yeah, Charlie? I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's a massive hole. You're talking about someone who literally cre- connects all the passes in the final third. You play yeah. through him. Without him now, who's, who's going to fill in that role and can they do it? even as half as good as Morales because you're talking about a front three that can always compete against any other front three in MLS. They, when those guys are fit and in form, they are dangerous. They can hit you from every angle, but without that playmaker Morales to expose the right, to make the right pass, to expose those, those open areas that the defense uh, fails to cover. It's almost like you're not going to be able to utilize those front three the way yeah. that they can be. So without him, it's going to, it's going to be a, a interesting uh, time to see if Medina can come in and fill that role. If you, if you move in uh, to jury to, to, to that role. Um, but if you play Tati Castellanos up top, basically in a four, four, two with Eber and let Eber fall off the front line and be that creative player. No, no. Nope. <laughs> you, you, you need him. You, you need, need Eber in the box. What to score yeah. goals. Yeah. He's not. He's not that player that you're taking away from 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 him being at his best, which is being the high number nine, the guy who can get in behind, make those runs, be in the box all the time. You don't want him dropping deep in the midfield trying to get other other guys the opportunities. It's amazing in tournaments how quickly things can change. NYCFC one zero loss in the first game. If they lose here, they could be looking at a, an early exit for a team that won the Eastern Conference. Orlando sitting on that win, of course. They got the late winner against Miami. So this is a huge game coming up. Uh, For Predict 6, you can also go look at the picks for Philadelphia, Miami, Montreal, Toronto. That one coming up on Thursday. D.C., New England. We're really impressed by what New England did. And then, of course, El Trafico this week. Because soccer's back, guys. El Trafico (laughs) is happening again. And we are so excited to see it. We've seen a lot of really good soccer so far. We've seen some really bad soccer as well. So... MLS is back, basically, is the only way to put it coming off that. Let's talk about one thing off the field before we get to the mailbag, and that is Charlotte Major League Soccer. They have put out a uh, a voting for their te- official team name coming forward. They want their te- fans to be involved. Um, there's about eight options out there that you can go through. Um, do you guys have any personal picks? Do you want to put your votes in? Charlie, I know you've been on their, uh, their social platforms over the last few weeks, so you're a Charlotte expert. Yeah. I would assume, yeah. and Doyle's maybe been there one time or never. The airport. I flew through the airport. Yeah. A couple and times. Doyle's flown through the airport. So you guys are the people that we need to make this decision. Do you yeah. have anything to weigh in on? I would go with the Monarchs. Any particular reason? Um, I just like the name. I, I know it has to do with the history being yeah. uh, the Queen City. Um, but I would go with Monarchs. 
Yeah, it, it was named it was named after Queen Charlotte, right? I mean, I assume that was her name. Yeah, uh, that's my second my second pick. My my first pick is, is Charlottetown because it's that was the original name of the of the settlement. Um, so I like I just like that it has a sort of a local flair to it. You can drop the FC; it doesn't need to be Charlottetown <laughs> FC, or if you can like make it SC if you want to have something because it is called soccer properly. Um, but yeah, Char- Charlottetown is my pick. Um, I love names that have local relevance, uh, and for that reason, Charlotte Monarchs would be my second my second choice. The other names out there, local relevance, Carolina Gliders FC, obviously because of the Wright brothers, all Carolina FC, Charlotte Athletic FC, so basically just being Charlton, uh, Charlotte Crown FC, and Charlotte FC. So Doyle probably should give up on the FC thing because it seems like it's going to stick as pretty much in all the options. We will see what happens, of course, Charlotte announced their first player in Sergio Ruiz coming over from Spain Um, a week ago, Austin FC announcing their first player. And those two teams will be joining us in 2021, which we look forward to. This gives us time for the mailbag. Charlie, we've been waiting for like two weeks to read this. mailbag. Please. Are you prepared? Yeah. I I love the mailbag. So a few weeks ago, we spoke about Christian Pulisic versus Landon Donovan and what he can be and what he has to be. Mm -hmm. And James Chelminski, of course, legend from Rockaway, New York, sent this email in and said, just a reminder that Charlie should read Time to Put Charlie on Blast a little. Oh, sorry. Oh, I love that. That was for me. He wants to talk about LD and Pulisic having different U.S. teams, huh? The U.S. before LD were ranked the worst team at the 1998 World Cup, and we narrowly qualified for the 2002 World Cup when LD wasn't a full member of the team. Only after the, and he uses this nickname, Executioner, became a regular were we the best team in CONCACAF and a tough dark horse on the international stage? Landon made the U.S. team what it was. Look at how pitiful it was. After he retired, fourth place in 2015 Gold Cup, fifth in the hex after finishing first three times in a row with LD. Pulisic had Josie and Bradley in their prime. Tim, Deuce, and others couldn't carry the U.S. in 2017 like Landon did in 2002 to 2014. Lastly, I don't give a darn what Pulisic does at the club level. Goats are made on the international level. Pulisic can do it versus Man City, but if he can't do it in Cuba on a rainy night, I don't care. So what, what's his point? That Landon is – that Christian is – I think you said that Christian's playing with a worse national team, so it's hard to put expectations on him. And he's saying that Landon came into a team that came out in 98 yes. through oh, to qualifying bad. Landon was at the same age, if not younger. And then Landon proceeded to turn okay. the U.S. into right. the best team in Concap. Great. This is where I'm going to get started. Now, when Landon came into that 2 team, sure, 98, they stunk. But 94, they were great. They overperformed what anyone had ever thought expectations-wise. Expectation wise. Now, you throw in 2002, that team, what it had as far as experience. You had three – you had – uh, seven players who had played in three World Cups. Okay, so that's that would be their third World Cup. You had 12 players who played in two World Cups. Now, why is that important? Because 98 was so bad that they all learned from that experience. They, they actually got to go to a World Cup. That's, that's the experience of qualifying for it. So they all qualified, and then they went to the World Cup, and it was bad. Then you had the 94 guys who qualified for it and had a great World Cup and then saw what happens – when you build up to get to a 98 and you get to that World Cup and it doesn't go so well. So you throw all that experience going into an 0-2, 02, to, uh, 02 team. Now you throw, now you talk about the experience while he's playing and how complete that roster was that Bruce Arena came in and said, okay, these, this is my team. We have youth. We have a blend of youth. We have a blend of, of guys who are about to break into being full-time uh, international stars. And you have guys who are, full-blown experience on their la- their last World Cup, their last legs, but can still offer something to the team. That is the difference between – and Landon Donovan wasn't in the 2014 World Cup. He might have been all the way up to the buildup, but let's not forget how well they did in that 2014 World Cup and they progressed out of the group. Sure. They bunkered. They bunkered. They, <laughs> they, they got the job done. When you advance out of the group, you advance out of the group, Whether no matter how you talk, spin it. They got out of the group. Fine. Okay. But 2017, and we're talking about Christian Pulisic now, the players that he'll have to play with, mind you, yeah, they're they're great, and it does 
matter what you do on the club level to have success at the international level. So I don't care what the, as far as go uh, just on the national side and not on the club side, you got to do it on both. Landon Donovan was balling for the galaxy or the San Jose earthquakes and on the national team. It wasn't like he wasn't balling where he was. You got to be doing it on both sides, but the club, the guys he's going to be playing with on the international level are Serginho Dest. Great. One of the best up and coming outside backs in, in, in the world. John Brooks, who would play in the 2014 World Cup. Weston McKinney, no World Cup experience. Sargent, no World Cup experience. Uh, uh, Ulysses uh, Yanez, no experience. Reggie Cannon, Tim Weah, Zach Steffen, Tyler Adams, Matt Turner, Gio Reyna, Josie Altador, possibly. Jackson Ewell, Aaron Locke. All these guys have no World Cup experience and no World Cup qualifying experience. You have to be put in those positions and you have to come together as a team and all those experiences make you a better team because you have to play different styles, different tactics, different philosophies and figure out ways to grind out wins on the international level. So until that happens, you can't compare Christian Pulisic to Landon Donovan because both of their paths are completely different. And sure, Christian Pulisic is ceiling is much is, is higher than Landon Donovan. So he can be the best player to ever play for the U.S. men's national team. But that doesn't translate to success in a World Cup. It's a complete team. You need a team to do well in a World Cup. And you see what Iceland did in, at the Euros. It's not they're the best team. They're not the, but they don't have the best players, but they're a, a team. They work together as a team. They know how to get success as a team. It takes a unit. That is the difference. So that is why I I said what I said. Enough so, said. So I, I, and I think that's the the best point, right? Because when Landon came in in two thousand two to that team, well, he really came in oh, in two thousand one. Um, that team, they were a team. Now, granted, it wasn't complete yet, and as pointed out by whoever the sent the email, James. Um, they struggled in qualifying, but that team struggled in qualifying because of injuries. They were without Chris Armas. They were without Claudio Reyna. They were without Brian McBride. They were without, like, it was on and on and on. So they didn't really start to function um, all that well until the very end of qualifying, at which point they got it done. And then Landon was able to come in and not have to be a focal point. He was a force magnifier for the team that already existed. And it was a team that existed in the locker room as well. Those guys, whether or not they were best friends or not, they were all on the same page. In 2016, 2017, I think it's pretty well documented that that team was fractured, that there were factions and cliques within the locker room who did not like or trust or want to play for each other and it certain or play for the managers and it certainly showed on the field and then Pulisic had the added pressure of not just being a force magnifier not being someone who could play off of Brian McBride or off of Claudio Reyna he actually had to be the focal point and Bruce Arena made him the focal point playing him as a 10 in that wide diamond which was just suicidal so it, it is kind of an unfair comparison mm -hmm. to say, well, Landon got it done and Pulisic didn't get it done. Um, that said, Pulisic's not a young player anymore. He's going to be 22 in a month. He is a Champions League player for two different teams now. He has played against the best teams in the world. And when World Cup qualifying starts again, he's in his prime. This He has to be the focal point. This is his cycle to show that, you know what, I am a $75 million winger, and to play for the U.S. the way he's been playing for Chelsea, regardless of how much World Cup experience the guys around him has. That's what a leader does. Boom. Knowledge. Chuck D, Matt D. That's what we do on Extra Time Radio. I've got nothing else for you. It's been fun talking soccer. We've seen some cool stuff on the field. We'll that see feels some more good. Oh my coming God, forward. That feels good. Let's, Let's go. go. On I'm, that I'm note, this Let's is go. Extra Time, driven by Continental. We'll see you next time. <laughs> yeah.